Chapter Fourteen, Part Two of the Short History of Scotland by Andrew Lang, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Fourteen, James the Fourth, Part Two. Surrey did not pursue his victory, which was won despite sore lack of supplies by his clever tactics, by the superior discipline of his men, by their marching powers, and by the glorious rashness of the Scottish king. It is easy, and it is customary, to blame James's adherence to the French alliance, as if it were born of a foolish chivalry. But he had passed through long stress of mind concerning this matter. If he rejected the allurements of France, if France were overwhelmed, he knew well that the turn of Scotland would soon come. The ambitions and the claims of Henry the Eighth were those of the first Edwards. England was bent on the conquest of Scotland at the earliest opportunity, and through the entire Tudor period England was the home, and her monarch the ally, of every domestic foe and traitor to the Scottish crown. Scotland, under James, had much prospered in wealth, and even in comfort. Ayala might flatter in some degree, but he attests the great increase in comfort and in wealth. In 1495 Bishop Elphinstone founded the University of Aberdeen, while 1496 Parliament decreed a course of school and college for the sons of barons and freeholders of competent estate. Prior Hepburn founded the College of St. Leonard's in the University of St. Andrews, and in 1507 Chapman received a royal patent as a printer. Meanwhile Dunbar, reckoned by some the chief poet of Scotland before Burns, was already denouncing the luxury and vice of the clergy, though his own life set them a bad example. But with Dunbar, Henryson, and others, Scotland had a school of poets much superior to any that England had reared since the death of Chaucer. Scotland now enjoyed her brief glimpse of the revival of learning, and James, like Charles the Second, fostered the early movements of chemistry and physical science. But Flodden ruined all, and the country, under the long minority of James V, was robbed and distracted by English intrigues, by the follies and loves of Margaret Tudor, by actual warfare between rival candidates for ecclesiastical place, by the ambitions and treasons of the Douglases and other nobles, and by the arrival from France of the son of Albany, that rebel brother of James the Third. The truth of the saying, Woe to the kingdom whose king is a child, was never more bitterly proved than in Scotland between the day of Flodden and the day of the return of Mary Stuart from France, 1513 to 1561. James V was not only a child and fatherless, he had a mother whose passions and passionate changes in love resembled those of her brother Henry the Eighth. Consequently, when the inevitable problem arose, was Scotland during the minority to side with England or with France? The Queen Mother wavered ceaselessly between the party of her brother, the English King, and the party of France, while Henry the Eighth could not be trusted, and the policy of France in regard to England did not permit her to offer any stable support to the cause of Scottish independence. The great nobles changed sides constantly, each fighting for his own hand, and for the spoils of a church in which benefices were struggled for and sold like stocks in the exchange. The question, was Scotland to ally herself with England or with France, later came to mean, was Scotland to break with Rome or to cling to Rome? Owing mainly to the selfish and unscrupulous perfidy of Henry the Eighth, James V was condemned, as the least of two evils, to adopt the Catholic side in the great religious revolution, while the statesmanship of the Beatons, Archbishops of St. Andrews, preserved Scotland from English domination, thereby preventing the country from adopting Henry's church, the Anglican, and giving Calvinism and Presbyterianism the opportunity which was resolutely taken and held. The real issue of the complex faction fight during James's minority was thus of the most essential importance, but the constant shiftings of parties and persons cannot be dealt with fully in our space. James's mother had a natural claim to the guardianship of her son, and was left regent by the will of James the Fourth, but she was the sister of Scotland's enemy Henry the Eighth. Beaton, Archbishop of Glasgow, later of St. Andrews, with the Earl of Arran, now the title of the Hamiltons, Huntley and Angus were to advise the Queen till the arrival of Albany, son of the brother of James the Third, who was summoned from France. Albany, of course, stood for the French alliance, but when the Queen Mother, August sixth, fifteen fourteen, married the new young Earl of Angus, the grandson and successor of the aged traitor, Bell the Cat, the Earl began to carry on the unusual, unpatriotic policy of his house. The appointment to the See of St. Andrews was competed for by the poet Gowan Douglas, uncle of the new Earl of Angus, and himself of the English party, by Hepburn, prior of St. Andrews, who fortified the abbey, and by Foreman, Bishop of Moray, a partisan of France, 
and a man accused of having induced James the Fourth to declare war against England. After long and scandalous intrigues, Foreman obtained the sea. Albany was regent for a while, and at intervals he repaired to France. He was in the favour of the Queen Mother when she later quarrelled with her husband, Angus. At one moment, Margaret and Angus fled to England, where was born her daughter Margaret, later Lady Lennox, and the mother of Henry Darnley. Angus, with whom, now recrossed the border, 1516, and was reconciled to Albany. Against all unity in Scotland Henry intrigued, bribing with a free hand, his main object being to get Albany sent out of the country. In early autumn, 1516, Holm, the leader of the borderers at Flodden, and his brother were executed for treason. In June, 1517, Albany went to seek aid and counsel in France, when the Queen Mother returned from England to Scotland, where, if she retained any influence, she might be useful to her brother's schemes. But contrary to Henry's interests, in this year Albany renewed the old alliance with France, while in 1518 the Queen Mother desired to divorce Angus. But Angus was a serviceable tool of Henry, who prevented his sister from having her way, and now the heads of the parties in the distracted country were Aaron, chief of the Hamiltons, and Beaton, archbishop of Glasgow, standing for France, and Angus representing the English party. Their forces met at Edinburgh in the street battle of Cleanse the Causeway, wherein the archbishop of Glasgow wore armour, and the Douglases beat the Hamiltons out of the town, April 30th, 1520. Albany returned, 1521, but the nobles would not join with him in an English war, 1522. Again he went to France, while Surrey devastated the Scottish border, 1523. Albany returned while Surrey was burning Jedburgh, was once more deserted by the Scottish forces on the Tweed, and left the country forever in 1524. Angus now returned from England, but the Queen Mother cast her affections on young Henry Stuart, Lord Methven, while Angus got possession of the boy King, June 1526, and held him, a reluctant ward, in the English interest. Lennox was now the chief foe of Arran, and Angus, with whom Arran had coalesced, and Lennox desired to deliver James out of Angus's hands. On July 26, 1526, not far from Melrose, Walter Scott of Buccleuch attacked the forces guarding the prince. Among them was Kerr of Cessford, who was slain by an Elliot when Buccleuch's men rallied at the rock called Turn Again. Hence sprang a long-enduring blood feud of Scots and Kerrs, but Angus retained the prince, and in a later fight in the cause of James's delivery, Lennox was slain by the Hamiltons, near Linlithgow. The spring of 1528 was marked by the burning of a Hamilton, Patrick, abbot of Fern, at St. Andrews, for his Lutheran opinions. Angus had been making futile attacks on the border thieves, mainly the Armstrongs, who now became very prominent and picturesque robbers. He meant to carry James with him on one of these expeditions. But in June 1528 the young king escaped from Edinburgh Castle, and rode to Stirling, where he was welcomed by his mother and her partisans. Among them were Arran, Argyll, Moray, Bothwell, and other nobles, with Maxwell and the Lord of Buccleuch, Sir Walter Scott. Angus and his kin were forfeited. He was driven across the border in November, to work what mischief he might against his country. He did not return till the death of James V. Meanwhile James was at peace with his uncle, Henry VIII. He, 1529 to 1530, attempted to bring the border into his peace, and hanged Johnny Armstrong of Gilnaki, with circumstances of treachery, says the ballad, as a ballad-maker was certain to say. Campbell's, Maclean's, and Macdonald's had all this while been burning each other's lands, and cutting each other's throats. James visited them, and partly quieted them, incarcerating the Earl of Argyle. Bothwell and Angus now conspired together to crown Henry the Eighth in Edinburgh, but in May, 1534, a treaty of peace was made, to last till the death of either monarch, and a year longer. End of chapter 14, part 2